जय हिंद जय भारत एंड वेलकम टू डेप टॉक्स दिस इज आदि अचिंद टुडे इज एन इंटरेस्टिंग सब्जेक्ट बहुत बारी ये एक सब्जेक्ट वी रेफर टू दिस ऑन दिस प्रोग्राम कॉल दी आर्कटिक रूट द नेक्स्ट वॉर ऐसे ऐसे बड़े बड़े टर्म्स यूज करे गए हैं एज अ मैटर फैक्ट आई यूज इट मेजर जनरल प्रदीप सिंह हुज हेयर विद अस हैज यूज्ड इट जनरल रायन हैज यूज्ड इट अ लॉट ऑफ पीपल हैव यूज्ड दिस टर्म इसके बारे में थोड़ी सी लेट्स ट्राई एंड अंडरस्टैंड व्हाट व्हाट दिस इज ये जगह क्या है I don't think uh, many people would have actually looked at the map of that region kyunki bahut interesting jagah hai and there's a lot of space there if i may and where there is space there is competition where there is competition there is of course the regular good old players of the world usa russia china and now of course a very very strong presence in the future of india as well so let's try and understand what this game is thank you so much sir good evening and welcome to the show Good evening, Adi. It's good to be back again and uh, talking Sir. about something which is uh, something which is strategically very important and but not much talked about. So uh, we we got to realize that uh, you know there is a strategic competition which is on in the Arctic, and there, are, if you look at the entire geopolitics of the world, uh, we got to understand that. Uh, there are there are three base you know primary things which are happening one is that the entire geopolitics has taken a shift there's a paradigm shift because there are new uh, alliances new caucuses being built up uh, you know on the, and all this has been triggered by the uh, ukraine war and then second is the climate change Uh, which is a big topic in itself uh, and the and primarily the arctic region and uh, becomes assumes importance because of uh, the global warming and the melting of the ice and opening of sea routes and uh, what in the implications of this ukraine war while the geopolitical shift is taking place we got to see as to how the geo, uh, you know the the implications of the ukraine war are having an if, uh, effect on the arctic as such let's uh, we going to see that now just like you have the indo pacific right and we talk a lot about indo pacific and we lot talk a lot about the south china sea but we do not talk about the arctic circle Correct. Uh, now this, when you look at look at strategic uh, dimensions, uh, you know, uh, geographical dimensions, the Arctic Circle is the next big thing, and the next area of conflict or strategic competition as of today. But tomorrow, uh, it's going to be an area of conflict. So we we got to understand this. And uh, today, I shall make make an endeavor. Uh, to make our viewers understand as to firstly why did i keep you know talking about the arctic circle when it came to the ukraine war mm -hmm. and uh, how is it how has the ukraine war triggered or changed the dynamics of the arctic uh, circle now you will ask me as to sir why 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 are we talking about it you know the nato's expansion remember mm. when we discussed you know the expansion of nato and why uh, ukraine war has been forced stroke triggered now i'm i'm going beyond uh, something which uh, we got to understand some may some may ridicule it uh, well they have their own opinions But the fact of the matter is the expansion of nato eastwards is a trigger and final is a trigger and the final straw uh, final trigger is this ukraine because uh, the russians were always saying do not expand do not expand keep ukraine as a neutral country however the americans and the west uh, primarily the united states uh, made it very sure that there is a confrontation between the russians and the uh, and the west in ukraine and ukraine is just a pawn ukraine is just a pawn as far as i am concerned in the entire uh, strategic game now 
the moment ukraine got attacked by the russians what happened it hastened up the it hastened up the membership of finland and sweden into nato we agree to that and uh, that that was very crucial now, why was that crucial to the united states now i'll just give you a little uh, background to this uh, you know the arctic circle is such only eight countries they they have borders or they or they have their uh, you know access mm -hmm. or direct access to the arctic circle or to the arctic region they are called the a8 arctic eight countries now which are those arctic eight countries is the united states that is alaska then canada finland denmark iceland norway sweden and russia so when you, when you look at the whole thing before the ukraine war and till uh, as late as last month last last month when the uh, when finland uh, was it, as when sweden also uh, you know joined the nato there were only five countries which were nato nations mm. out of the eight right now out of the seven. eight seven seven are nato countries and russia is the one that they are opposing so so was was ukraine made to shift the focus on the north sir absolutely absolutely this is now, <clears throat> now <laughs> if we can have a if we can have a map uh, for yes, all those sir. people maybe some of us do not really know that russia and united states are actual neighbors now and they're separated uh, by about two point uh, two and a half nautical miles that's about all you know the uh, the boundary that runs through the bering strait uh, bering uh, strait is there are two islands dardanelles little and the bigger one or the larger one and that is just 2.5 nautical miles so united states and russia are actually neighbors and uh, for whatever for whatever was the reason russia today repents having sold alaska to the united states absolutely and the united states was smart enough at that particular time to have gone and bought alaska and become neighbors to the russians then the uh, you know then the soviet uh, russia the ussr so this is this is something which we really do not understand because everybody views the map as a, a you know as the earth is flat when you look at the world map you look at it as a world world is flat and you go by the theory of uh, thomas friedman the earth is flat but actually it isn't and if you view it from the uh, you know from the north south you will find uh, as a globe when you view it as a globe then you will find that they are neighbors Hmm. So obviously, when you have neighbors, uh, there's always a conflict between neighbors. And uh, now we're coming to the fact that this entire thing has got militarized. Now, how has it got militarized is what we will see. And this has got militarized because of the climate change. Hmm. Of course, of course, there were you know uh, bases. In Russia, along the uh, coastline, and in Alaska as well, but the strategic competition and the race—I would, I may just put it—the race to the Arctic region uh, or to influence the Arctic region has commenced, and which will have ramifications if, uh, if not in the next, uh, you know, decade. In this particular decade itself, at least, if not in this decade, in the next decade, hundred percent. So, can I have the next slide, please? Yes, sir. Now, uh, when you look at this map, you got to understand 
uh, you will you will see who are the bordering countries you find united states that is the alaska canada then you have greenland now greenland uh, is part of denmark so that is how it is there and iceland norway russia and down below sweden now what you see in the green and what you see in blue and red these are the various routes which can be followed or which are navigable through the arctic circle uh, where all these routes converge is the bering strait and uh, you know that's a narrow stretch now the beauty of the whole thing is that the most navigable portion is the northern sea route which is in the red and which goes along the coast of russia and uh, it starts from murmansk and goes right up to the bering strait now if you have to navigate you have to the russians have made it sure that they have built adequate facilities all along the way now what is it 19 19 bases sir sorry uh, is it 19 or 17 or 19 military bases they have already made right yeah it's 17 bases 17 bases and some are on the on uh, are coming up now now we will see those uh, bases I, i have a slide to show this now uh, the interesting part again is that the entire coastline 50% of it is with russia of the arctic circle of the northern sea route 50% of it is with russia and the russians have got bases and russians have got uh, have developed facilities and uh, they're looking at the future now obviously when you have 50% and the rest of 50% is with the, the a7 now it is a7 versus russia right the arctic 7 versus uh, singular russia so this is the conflict which is taking place the balance of 50% is the, with the a7 now when it comes to the population around in this area the overall population here is around 4 million now out of 4 million 2 million is with russia and uh, 2 million is, are russians so 50% of the population 50% of the you know uh, land mass uh, which is in touch with the arctic is with russia and the balance is with the a7 now they have some indigenous people who reside over here there are about 500000 uh, you know indigenous people uh, who are natives of this region and, and kind of uh, they, they they have been there for centuries and they survive there and they live there and they're native now this was a generally a peaceful area well, let's get it right and this was generally a peaceful area and uh, there was something called the arctic council which came about and which constituted these uh, eight countries eight countries plus they had representation five members in the council from the indigenous uh, population and later on they started giving observer status as as they found that this this route and this area was uh, you know economically a very potent area uh, more and more countries started showing a lot of interest in this particular region now just to get these figures right uh 90 billion barrels of oil 90 billion barrels of oil is supposed to be available in this particular region 1669 trillion cubic feet of natural gas is available here i thought all this 40... was finishing in 10 years sir no <laughs> 44 billion barrels of natural gas liquefied natural gas is also available so that is the kind of you know hydrocarbons in the natural resources and, and i was just talking about hydrocarbons that is available now when all this uh, these estimates came about 
a lot of countries started showing interest in this particular uh, region obviously because uh, everybody wants to have a share of the uh, you know share of the pie interestingly this is not part of the global common common you know that globals common area no it violates international waters all that and all that but the eez extends to 200 nautical miles we all understand and if you see the extent of the you know eez the uh, they all kind of clash and they are uh, kind of overlapping so there is no global commons here and such so this area or the property or the eez as rightfully belonging to all these countries now another interesting fact comes about here is the un convention on the laws of sea us united states is not a signatory to it when united states is not a signatory to it many uh, kind of concessions which are applicable because of the un clause are not applicable to the united states that's another interesting fact right now uh as far as the arctic circle is concerned we have got observer status and i'll just name those countries initially there were france germany netherlands poland spain switzerland and uk and then it got beefed up with china japan india italy south korea and singapore so india is also a enjoys an observer status in the arctic council right now arctic council the permanent eight or in the a8 uh, they have their presidency which gets rotated every two years right when the ukraine war uh, when they had, uh, took place started in 2022 russia was the president of this council now sanctions were imposed when sanctions were imposed and russia was kind of taken off and said thank you very much uh, you are no longer the president and we do not believe in you and kind of it got isolated so these sanctions had an effect on the ukraine uh, you know because of the ukraine war the sanctions had an effect on the arctic uh, council now what happens the arctic council becomes kind of defunct because and and in their understanding everything has to be you know mutually decided uh, together and 50% is stake in any cases with russia hmm now you'll ask me sir what about where does china fit in where does india fit in now china has over a period of time you know been making inroads into the arctic circle because of energy constraints it has and the energy requirement it has uh, so let's let's have the next slide so the route yeah so if you just see this if uh, if we just study this if you have to go by the suez canal the route is about 20000 kilometers and if you have to go by the northern sea route it's about 13000 kilometers if you have to go from tokyo to uh, hamburg so that's that's one way to look at it and so the distance is shortened by 7000 kilometers which is 7000 kilometers around 5000 miles which is uh, you know significant and the number of days also there's one slide which shows the number of days it takes uh, from for the chinese we can see that also now the, the next please next please next please another one okay another one sorry <laughs> another one <laughs> yeah this yeah. one so if you if you have to go from dalian that is uh, one of the ports major ports of uh, china to rotterdam uh, 
uh, the, the time taken is 35 days. Whereas if you go by the Suez Canal, it's 48 days. So obviously, you know, saving in time, saving in uh, costs, uh, all that. So China uh, is very much a big player today. Now, oh, over a period of time, what did China do? China started having, you know, as a part of it, it's, it calls it the Polar Silk Route. It took out an Arctic uh, white paper in 2018, interestingly, and it called this route the Polar Silk Route <laughs> and called itself and called itself a near Arctic state. Ah, it read, ah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it refers to itself in this uh, white paper, which is 2018 vintage. It calls itself as a near Arctic state. Okay. So uh, what what has it been doing? It has a major, I mean, you know, significant uh, investment, whatever Russia ke saath to hai, but it was collaborating a lot with Greenland, right? Greenland, that is Denmark, and also with Iceland. Now, Iceland is kind of, uh, uh, it's again, uh, a country which is totally at the mercy of China. Mm. As far as economy is concerned, and Russia, of course, they uh, in Russia they have been able to you know put in a lot of investment, and uh, as a part of the investment, they're developing a lot of ports and uh, facilities. So Russia is indebted, Iceland is indebted. Now Greenland. Uh, this is a very interesting story, which goes that one one Chinese businessman walked up to you know the Danes and said, "Look, I want to construct a golf course in Greenland." Listen oh, nice. To yes. So I want to create a golf course in a particular region. <sighs> Now he wanted to buy a huge, uh, you chunk know, of land. Of chunk of land over there, and then before they could actually conclude the deal, the Americans stepped in, and uh, the foreign ministry of Denmark it stepped in and said, "Sorry," because they were looking at having a, you know, coming up with a base over there. So this this golf course. Uh, Bahana or the guys, uh, you know, was or this attempt was thwarted. So, yeah. Greenland has become a little cautious of this and it came under a lot of uh, what do you call pressure. Uh, pressure. And so, they had to withdraw from this particular thing. So, they <laughs> so the, the Chinese have been dealing one to one, as I, I repeat again, with Russia, Iceland, and Greenland. Okay. Now, uh, the Americans have also been watching this, and uh, so have the NATO countries been watching it. Now, this is where the maximum amount of interaction or uh, maximum Russia-China collaboration is taking place, or cooperation mm -hmm. is taking place. And this is a cause of worry for the United States as well as NATO countries. So that is where the strategic uh, kind of competition or caution is existing as of today. And to mm. get Finland and Sweden on board was extremely necessary for, Second, NATO. for NATO. Second was uh, to kind of, you know, uh, put pressure on Russia and to decrease its fighting, war waging capability, etc, etc, and the economy. And uh, also, also kind of uh, put a check on the Chinese. Uh, 
the, the Chinese or have also stepped into this ice cutter business. You know, Correct. so they they had one ship, they had one ship called Zhu Long, Zhu Long, which is called Snow Leopard. I mean, it translates into Snow Leopard, which went across. And now they're looking at an ice cutter called Zulong 2. And then they're looking at a nuclear powered ice cutter. Ice cutter. Like the Russians have. So, yeah. So the Russians have got about 13 of them. So yeah. this kind of a thing uh, is happening in the Arctic Circle. Yes. Anything you want. We to are ask. training on those uh, ice crackers. I mean, our. our... I know of uh, there's there's a bunch of I think 25 odd sailors that have gone for training in into Russia for this. Correct. No. How does India step in? So, what what does now if if you read uh, there's a lot of lots and lots of uh, news items which talk of Russia, China, and India. You know, when you talk of the RIC, Russia, India, China, that uh, group, grouping, it is primarily to do with this, the trade through this route. Now, what are India's interests? India and Russia, of course, we know what are our ties. I mean, defense ties of our strategic ties of far, uh, you know, since very long and dependable, etc., etc. But I'm sure, and uh, it would be right to say that India, we, Bharat as such, is cautious of this Russia-China nexus or that closeness which is taking place. And that is a cause of concern to us. So if we are a party to this, there is a kind of a check and balance which is taking place in this entire you know, growing cooperation. Hmm. At least you know what is happening. Second is the oil which we have bought all the way from Russia post uh, Ukraine war. Quite a bit of it has come in through this route. Can I bloody right? right? Yeah. So when this route has been extensively used by the Indians, uh, Indian Marine. Uh, fleet as also by the Chinese, obviously, for India, it is a check on, uh, it is close rise, ties with Russia, it is a check on China, and China also has or to both. be a little cautious, or both, or both. both. yeah, so, uh, this is yeah, so this is something which, because you will find that tomorrow, Sooner or later, within, as I said, next, this decade, next decade, you will find a confrontation. You will have uh, two, three kinds of combinations. It's a US, US led NATO confrontation with uh, Russia, which is already taking place, hmm. right? US China tensions already taking place, right? But will it will it escalate, uh, and to what degree will it escalate? This is another matter, and uh, that also has to be watched. And Arctic is one area where the Americans, you know, uh, would like to finger uh, the Chinese and the Russians together. You would be aware that uh, you know last year I think there were about 30, 13 odd ships which sailed through the Bering Strait. They, they did a joint exercise and about 11,000 troops took part and uh, the bearings, they passed very close to the Aleutian Islands of the United mm. States and the US had, uh, you know, showed a lot of, created a lot, lot of hua about it. So, uh, the military presence is also being shown both by the Chinese and by the Russians together in areas very near to United States territory. So this is obviously a cause of concern. And what what, what are the logic that the, uh, you know, the exercise, aim of the exercise was anti-submarine and anti-air operations. 
Mm-hmm. So an, an anti-submarine and anti-air operations, you know, that is the entire uh, exercise all about. That yeah. means to detect planes and see what reaction the Americans would come about if they were uh, lurking around in those waters. Now, as I said, the international waters, anybody can go through. You cannot stop anybody. The Americans really cannot do anything about it. So this is this is the whole story, and this is where we will we find that a lot of uh, tensions slowly and slowly are building up. Now, coming on to the military, so we can see the other maps uh, which I just. Now these are the Russian and the American air bases which are there. <laughs> already existing right now as far as the russians are concerned uh, apparently they have much more than the uh, americans M- number of troops and more number of bases go next please and this is this is one which says i found this in arctic nation rim nations prepare for new cold war so this is this is what is happening here and uh, you know, there is the Arctic Circle is divided into, uh, I think, uh, three three parts: the uh, the north northern high, it's called the northern high, and then the middle and the near Arctic or something like that. So there are three concentric circles which are there, uh, and there are countries which are part of it. Yeah. Next. There you are. This is where the boundary runs. This is between the United States and uh, Russia. This is how it goes. And you find these uh, islands where the bases are there, uh, which the Russians have made. And this is the kind of icebreakers and uh, shipping route uh, which exists. And the next piece. Same, just to give you a better perspective. Yeah, next. Now, these are the Russian bases that you find, naval bases and all around. Next. Russians really thought this through, huh? Yeah, yeah, because now they've been at it for a much longer period of time. And... Uh, I, I have no, not got the photographs, but if you go onto the net, you find some crazy, uh, you know, military stations which they have established in uh, all these areas. Next, and these are the uh, bases. The biggest base of which is there uh, in Alaska is the Joint Base Element of Richardson J B E R, and uh, this is where. Uh, 22,000 troops, American troops are stationed. It houses the Alaskan Command and the North America Aerospace Defense Command. So there's an Alaskan Command which is located here and the Aerospace Defense Command which is you know headquartered in JBR. And uh, interestingly, a uh, lot of exercises take place. Our special forces also go there and train in Alaska for, uh, you know, High altitude warfare and para jumps and cold, things like that. Cold weather warfare. Cold weather warfare. So this is what happens. Yeah. So this is this is where it rests today, and uh, I just wanted to get the perspective right for everybody that one of the major reasons for uh, the Ukraine war is this particular region. You got South China Sea, or you got Indo-Pacific, and you got the Arctic. Now, amazing, when, amazing. When, when we, uh, yeah, when, when we have uh, when the you know the ice melts more, you will find this route totally opening up. And once this opens up, even you know, say summer season, it opens up. And uh, trade, uh, I mean, number of ships flying through this area increases. The competition is going to be 
you so you will have military vessels you you will naval uh, the naval vessels and you will have the commercial vessels and the area is limited but the traffic will increase and when traffic increases uh, and the density of movement increases there's going to be a tussle and uh, china will want to play a major part and the americans would not let it happen russia would claim major part of it so all these things are going to happen so this is a potential so one thing one thing you know there's there's a golden rule that war changes stuff war changes geopolitics and i guess they're using it the opposite way around when you want to change the geopolitics you create a war yeah and then you can at the back of it you can do do what you need to do and that's one of the reasons why i guess uh, poland is also being in uh, being kind of beefed up uh, you know it's going to yes. become the so called the concept of old europe versus the new europe to wo to that's that's something that we can see poland is is actually the strongest economy in europe right now by the way absolutely yeah they are, they are almost debt free <laughs> they've got everything going for themselves and they're militarily getting very strong and so yeah. do you think i mean i i i don't know when i look at the map i see poland as the main back base and sweden and finland as the as the as the fronts yes Pol poland i i i have been i was fortunate to have visited poland and and uh, having visited gdansk and these ports mm. so uh, well poland is all geared up and poland has the support you see from the very beginning i'll just take you back another 4 5 years when the nato forces were deployed each country was allocated a frontline you know scandinavian country or the nato country which was on the borders with russia the nato forces were deployed it is only in poland that the united states battalion group was deployed and it's interesting when you see you know some it's interesting some when you see, yeah yeah sorry i'm saying it's interesting when you see the politics of the uh, immigrants you know poland is the only country that did not allow any immigrants so their society is strong their Very demographic strong. is is within strong and basically polish they are they are uh, nationalistic and you know that's very interesting because the rest of the europe where they wanted to kill the old europe they're dead you know they've taken so many immigrants they'll never be nationalistic again the countries that are not like that are and poland probably was purposefully kept out poland you see when you, when you go there the nationalism shows over there yeah it shows it shows it is there in everybody's heart you know you go to you go to auschwitz you you go to all those areas i mean and they the way they narrate it is is uh, i mean it, it gives you goosebumps the way they go you about narrating yeah i've been to auschwitz and i crossed once it, i just didn't have the courage to go there i was no, in, i i've been I mean I didn't go to the concentration camp I was in Germany in close to Fra Frankfurt and there's this one uh, something some facility I forget now some Nazi facility was there where they they used to do stuff to you know children and stuff like that so I just no, I, I I I I've, I've been to the gas chambers I've seen the gas chambers <sighs> I I you know you would be surprised they made jackets they made leather bags out of human skin yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. i mean uh, that All that uh, uh that camp commander's wife what was her name uh eliza croft uh she was uh, she was the commander of uh, her her husband was the commander of uh, auschwitz uh, there was another camp that came up which was uh, trebianka either trebianka mm -hmm. or well, yeah so the, she was the commander's wife there and she used to she i mean you guys i don't want to say stuff you guys if you want to learn about it search for the most oh, it's, it's, evil is very sad in history i mean it's she's terrible very, very what sad. she did I, I, and I she mean, got caught by the way 
she got caught and when they asked her what why did you do this she said why because i liked it hmm. simple as that so so then auschwitz is a it's a it's it's a after you visit that you know you kind of uh, you can never forget it sir let's get into some questions sir uh, guys please like the video subscribe to the channel and uh, spread the word about dev talks so share kariye bilkul and of course uh, if you can do contribute to the dev talks efforts you can do it by using the qr code or the paypal link in the description ya fir super stickers super chats let's get into what you guys actually say and you know before i do there are so many of these horrors that have happened around the around the world sir auschwitz is one of them i mean yeah. you got the bengal famine not one stone not one jhanda is there commemorating mm, that i mean uh, Four million people lost their lives. Nobody even talks about it. I, yeah, I, 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 it's, it's a shame for us, as a, as a matter of fact, and I'd say this openly. It's a shame as a country that we cannot put a flag, put a simple stone and a flag with a twenty-four-seven jyoti, yar, commemorating the lives of the four million people. Imagine how they would have died. Sick. We, we just. we forget we in india we need to kind of remember our history otherwise we, we are bound to repeat it you know a, a soldier a, you have a martyr a, a person gets killed fighting terrorists a soldier gets martyred and he dies in the line of duty and you'll find a small small you know mention of it somewhere in in the newspaper i mean you know i went to kazakhstan and uh, in kazakhstan when a couple gets married right after the church it goes they go to the war memorial war memorial and pay all the stars in normally the do that sir in the same dress straight shot on... i have pictures i have pictures with the couple and then we asked what is this he says hey everybody after a marriage after getting married would straight away go to the uh, freedom fighters that memorial over there yeah, yeah, so that yeah, is the yeah. kind of reverence they have because there are a lot of people who made great sacrifices to protect the nation and unfortunately in india uh, of course it's building up but uh, this nationalism yeah. needs to yeah. really really No, sir. I, I, you're you hit the nail on the head, sir. I keep saying this, boss. The only thing that will save your country today. Look at the kind yeah. of narrative that are running across. Koi kabi kuch bolta hai, kabi kuch bolta hai. Badi. Ek taraf China laga hua, ek taraf US laga hua, ek taraf Pakistan laga hua, ek taraf Germany laga hua. Everybody is wanting to just finger into India. The only thing that is keeping you together right now is your nationalism. Keep the country together. Koi chhuni sakta uske baad. So that's something. Absolutely, you hit the nail on the head, sir. No question about it. So let's see the first question, sir. Tony Stark, thank you so much. He says, "If a war between Russia and USA, who would win?" I think <laughs> we all would lose. <laughs> we all would lose. Yeah, all of us would lose because yeah. it is not going to be a conventional war in any case. So, if it's not a conventional war, it will go into the next domain, uh, nuclear domain, and that is. It will all depend who fights first. As a matter of fact, Tony, I'd like to tell you we've done a war gaming episode with uh, Colonel Ajay Raina on how this World War Three, you know, it's it's on a 2019 study which is before the Ukraine conflict. So how this World War Three would open out is pretty accurate actually with the situation today. Wherever the flare-ups are there, that study actually predicts Ukraine, Israel, you know, exactly like that only. So no, if you want, please have a look. I I will I will quote a Rand study, Rand Sir. report in 2000. Nineteen. Now I'll just quote Rand report in 2019, which was sponsored by the United States Army, and that study is how to destabilize Russian borders. Okay, read that, and, and it talks of Ukraine, Belarus, Moldova, and and uh, it extends to Russia. Caspian. It, it, yeah, and, and it aims at draining out all the resources. So I mean, it's a study by Rand Corporation. Yeah. So and it's in public domain. So it's not that. Yeah. So there is a 
there is a website and i keep mentioning this again and again there is a website called albert einstein institute of non violent regime change <laughs> albert <laughs> einstein <laughs> dot org <laughs> non non violent okay. regime change and uh, you know i when, when i was say in my teens i would read a lot of this uh arthur haley and desmond bagley and all that mm. stuff mm. alistair maclean you had regimes being changed in that and yeah. it was always yeah. this american operatives who were uh, you know on the center of the thing and how they go about changing regimes and when you when you look at those when you look back i mean it was actually happening and now you realize that that's how it is that's how it works yep yep it's amazing sir i mean when you when you read this gene sharp's books you were like what the hell here is a checklist on how to do a regime change yes they and the, the, you know, after all these novels and whatever fiction it may be it may sound fiction but it's based on something which is actually taking yeah. place or yeah. is intended to and take place by the way item number 46 or 64 one of the two is farm workers protest <laughs> which is which has happened in europe yeah. which is happening in india so it's like a, you can go through the checklist and you you know your jaw drops you like what the hell is this nonsense anyways there let's let's <laughs> yeah digress So many uh, Nayak, uh, thank you so much for your contribution. He says, sir, why not a land route through Siberia till Vladivostok and then a sea route till China? In the in West, why not a land route through Stan nations till China? Well, I'm I'm sure that they're already existing. The land routes are existing, and uh, it is just opening up of the Arctic Ocean because a lot of sh- uh, shipping takes place. and the shipping is the primary you know means of transport through which the you you seen uh, dali with so many containers i mean that's how it goes yes sir so you can't be shifting containers uh, you know so many containers and moving them by road moving them onto the ship so uh, avoiding double handling if i may just put it sir Anuish, thank you so much. He says, uh, uh, "Adi, hundred percent true about Poland. They did not suffer a single terrorist attack, not even a single killing, by as you say, SWL people. Uh, I call them Sino-Wahabi leftists, sir. So, hmm. no, me, no, no. They alarm. made it very clear. I, I went to, uh, you know, you would have heard that uh, viral statement by their yeah, foreign yeah. minister in in uh, where he addresses. He says not a single attack, and he proudly says so. He says because we don't permit all these immigration. Im- Immigrants, mm-hmm. and you will not. You know, sir, I'll order. ask you a question, sir. I'll ask you a question on this, and I'm going to ask the audience also if anybody can respond to this. Which is the second most bombed non-war country in the world? Second most bombed non-war mm-hmm. country, a country that is not in war, but is the second most bombed country in the world. Anybody? Interesting. Would you, sir? No, I mean. without and the answer will shock you hmm. somebody said switzerland anybody else let me just vietnam no hmm. anybody else anybody else anybody else think 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 guys it is laos cambodia afghanistan britain no it's sweden hmm. the amount of grenade attacks in sweden today are insane insane Good. because they're filled with the islamists theek hai so it's the second most non bombed non war country the most bombed non war country is afghanistan the second mm. is sweden interesting and it's supposed to be happiest is it one of the happiest ones was supposed to be i mean the 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 the, the scandinavian nordic Scandinavian country is supposed to be the happier lot. Right? Yeah, yeah. Finland, I think, is number one. Yeah. No, no. Finland has a lot of problems as well, sir. He there lot of problems there also. <laughs> uh, Rishi Kiranji, thank you so much for this very interesting question. He says, uh, firstly, uh, not very interesting question, very interesting comment. 
about general sir i love watching general behel sir his knowledge is immense he gives strategic perspective of top down thinking of a general officer thanks to such military leaders we are in safe hands absolutely agree thank and thank you for putting that across thanks rishi thank you very much lajwanti ji as adi this afternoon i read an article on in earth in an earth science journal about the arctic ice increasing this year ma'am if you can please send this article to me on mail yeah, I'll, i'll 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 be sure to comment on it sometime uh unknown gunman 007 he says sir ji arctic ke resources ke liye nahi ke kahin fir se military conflict to nahi hoga wohi to baat kar rahe ho hoga na <coughs> military conflict hoga aaj nahi hoga is ticket mein nahi hoga agle ticket mein to hoga and because that is the next uh, you know th- that is what we are building to birds and isliye hum aap se baat kar rahe hain this is what we are trying to educate you ki ye hone wala hai ji aaj aaj south china sea mein taiwan conflict ki baatein hoti hain kal ko depending on your age if you are a young man you will maybe you will see this in your lifetime Yep. the panka says if there's a potential conflict between russia and us lying in the future concerning alaska yeah, that's worried they worried russia, russia as i said is regretting having given given away uh what do you call uh, alaska to the united states and united states is building its bases over there and uh, uh, trust me it's it's a little you know it it is away from the mainland uh, united states to great degree canada will canada will come to its help to put how much of a degree of help will it come to so there is there is an issue there is a separate command there are 22000 troops as i said uh, in just one location so let's take the other locations another another 10 or 1000 or 30 to 40000 troops are already stationed in alaska for what that's for what heavy presence and and uh, i remember you, you uh, there is this uh, news item about the uh, what do you call what weapons directed energy weapons <laughs> so the experiments on the directed energy is also taking place over there Mm. and does mm. one square kilometers one square kilometer of an area uh, from where all these energy uh, you know the base is there where direct energy weapons are going to are located and uh, by the united states so the dws are going to bring in bring down all the satellites aircraft so lots is happening there which we are not aware as of today true Harshal ji thank you so much for your contribution and your question is right here he says my question be might be out of context uh, what do you think would happen in belarus after the current regime of lukashenko people in belarus are pro eu and might not be interested in dictatorship i another, you see another ukraine sir? another ukraine uh, belarus uh, russians will not let belarus just go away like that and uh, the the west is already trying to engineer uh, what was that and maidan what maidan mm. was it euro uh, maidan euro maidan which is uh, in uh, belarus and they're hoping that such a thing would happen uh, because uh, belarus being a strong ally of the russians the uh, regime change we just talked about is what is intended to be done and sure. uh, turn the tables yeah abhishek that's asked is china the, that, check on this sorry that's why you have the tnws which have been deployed by the russians in belarus so that nobody tries to Come you know yeah. fool around with them so the first part we've already spoken about china is a player in the arctic we've spoken about this uh, second yes. part is an interesting question he says how did russia get such a big head start in the arctic with so many nato countries being there yeah because they were peaceful nato countries <laughs> okay you see arctic arctic circle was supposed to be is uh, was supposed to be uh, not a, it it was a economically and scientific 
uh, only economic activities and scientific activities were supposed to take place over there. And mm. the Russia has 50% of the border and the rest of the Scandinavian countries were mostly peace-loving nations. And uh, just to let you know, I, I think Finland had vowed to be neutral after 1948. Correct. And and Sweden, Sweden. for the last two la, Sweden for last two centuries has been neutral. And on now paper, the tables have turned. The Second World War, at on least. Paper, I mean, they they were never siding with any country or any alliance. Uh, but lo and behold, the tables get turned, and uh, you know, today they're a part of this. So yeah. the Russians, obviously, the Soviet Russia. I obviously had a big head start on this. And True, the sir. Russians were... Yeah. Anuish says, thank you so much. According to French, Canadian, Alaska is theirs. Well, the fact of the matter is that it's American territory. Just too bad. They can keep assuming. <laughs> Gumnavi Baba says, please shed some light on role of nuclear icebreakers in the Arctic and Russian supremacy when it comes to the same. Yeah, nuclear ice breakers are basically powered by nuclear reactors. So it's the nuclear, when you talk of a nuclear, uh, you know, sub or a, you talk of a nuclear icebreaker, it's basically the power. I mean, uh, they're being powered through nuclear energy and that's about it. And uh, as far as the Russians are concerned, uh, we've, our nuclear reactors are being built by the Russians. So... They have an edge in this technology and they've uh, kind of taken a lead on that. So, Batraji says, uh, Adiji and Behel sir, Chinese are buying uh, an island in the north of Canada towards the Arctic for this purpose you mentioned. I'm not sure of this. I'll have to, I mean, Batraji, See, I, kind have of read, I have, the I have read about, no, no, I have read about I'm not, this. The Chinese, I'm not aware of this. Sir. Yeah, they're looking, they, they are, uh, in the process of buying a particular island, and mm -hmm. uh, it is there in the news. So, for this very purpose. Actually, I want to take this one question, if you don't mind, sir, because uh, this will actually explain a lot. He says, "Why Russia doesn't have nuclear air, uh, nuclear aircraft carriers? Why Russia does not have nuclear aircraft carriers? Interesting one. I mean, it is. It is." Uh, yeah, it is interesting. I really do not have an answer to this because they have right. they, they have the they have, they have the they have the technology, uh, they have the wherewithal, and uh, well, I don't know. May I, sir? Yeah, please. Uh, I personally feel the reason that they didn't because they were primarily a land force, fifty thousand tanks during the Second World War. Their idea was to invade Europe or invade. The, the the Middle East or invade here there, but not move out the heartland of the world. The Russians know that they're in the heartland, the place which has the most energy, the most everything. They don't need to go anywhere for anything. So they just didn't build any. They had two of them. One they gave us. They still have one. <laughs> That's yeah. what I think. I mean, uh, just my thought process. Yeah, I mean, I don't if know they if want to, if, if, if they want to, they can. But uh, they haven't. That's about it. Uh, Swaminil, once again, thank you so much. Uh, he says, some multiple religious partitions of EU nations. Religious Is that a possible? Hmm. Nah, the, not going to happen. But not, not, on, not on religious lines. You, know, you see, while uh, Islamization is taking place, on one side, you have Islamization. The other side, you have white supremacists. So, mm. uh, and the white supremacists are coming into limelight because of Islamists. Oh, yeah. And they will not let that happen. Germany and yes. in France and in yeah. uh, uh, in uh, uh, Dutch, you see, uh, <coughs> Netherlands. Primarily, what uh, white supremacists were always there, you know. But... They, they were not uh, so, uh, what do you call, vocal and not, not so much in the news. They have come in primarily because of the Islamists and the influx which is taking place and the number of uh, immigrants which are coming in. 
so obviously mm -hmm. the nationalist spirit is coming about and uh, they will not let that happen the so, spirit from our take rishikesh gora second last question sir he says uh, uh, is it possible near future to for powerful european countries germany and france to ally with the ruskies for energy and resources well, germany is already aligned i mean there's no there's no two ways about it it just it's just that they don't want to come about it in the open and they they have suffered a setback because of the uh, what do you call those uh, blasting of the what are that uh, pipelines north stream right north stream north stream, north stream pipelines so uh, they they are already aligned they are dependent and trust me they are the ones who want this war to end the earliest because economically germany has gone down and france uh, today is making statements because it wants to remain what do you call uh, <laughs> relevant <laughs> It, it doesn't want to go become irrelevant it wants wants to become remain relevant in the entire picture so that's what is happening okay. abhijit last one sir he says thank you for the insight uh, ukraine foreign minister is india what kind of a deal is he trying to get with bharat good one what kind of a deal is he trying to get in bharat is a uh, he understands that india is friends with russia india is india is respected member of the world community india has a say among the among the uh, global south and uh, in, india is economically growing so when you consider all that india becomes an important partner in this in, um, important uh, you know player in this entire game so what is he looking at a uh he wants to get out uh he wants peace they'll be talking peace unfortunately that's not going to come about it, it cannot come about for a simple reason because the demands of ukraine are different are uh, ridiculous as far as the russians are concerned the russians are not going to agree to all that so a stalemate if it takes place or a ceasefire it takes place in the current situation is is kind of a win for russia and a loss of face for nato and the united states so he'll he'll be asking for peace on the his terms but that is uh, while we all understand not going to happen anyway the next thing he's going to ask for is ammunition because uh, you know ammunition sources have dried out as far as the west is concerned Uh, they are unable to meet uh, the artillery ammunition and uh, in india we do have a large chunk which is there unfortunately that's not going to be given to them for a simple reason that we have two enemical neighbors immediately on our on our this thing the third important factor is the economic part of it wherein he'll be looking at a greater participation of the indians of indian business players or uh, in the infrastructure development and uh, third is a uh, fourth would be also he would be promising uh, you know they would want more students to come and all those who come back from medical colleges engineering colleges they would want them i mean these kind of negotiations will take place and uh, of course he would also be wanting to sell his wares to india when it comes to uh, whatever cooperation was taking place and uh, especially in the drones field because ukraine has got a very well established uh, drone industry and india has also been vying for it so all these kind of things would take place more those four five things would get discussed we'll hear of it tomorrow in the news yes sir as a matter of fact i think also he's going to try and negotiate to get prime minister modi there that's going to be one of yeah. the biggest things on his agenda they they've always been wanting and because that will have an impact on the you know kind of on the world just take two short ones of ramesh what would be an arctic sea naval battle look like brother that's going to take us half the night mm -hmm. to discuss but <laughs> that'll be interesting that it'll, it'll be a nice war gaming exercise but yeah. uh, you know yeah mon holocaust mon 
1970s, 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 